a short message and thought here tonight uh, that I think might be an encouragement to you. Not telling you anything you don't already know. Nailing down a few things you, all, you already know. Uh, Acts chapter 24. This is one of those times when they had the Apostle Paul drug in there for his, you know, he'd get in trouble and get drug in there and he'd have to give his testimony and stand up for what was right. And uh, he'd always tell them and the Bible said some believe and some believe not. And that's still the way it is. Some believe and some believe not. And uh, it's still that way today. But this time they were, they were accusing him of a bunch of stuff and he was right with the Lord and, and he said they can't prove what they're accusing me of. But he said this, look at verse 14, and I'll use this to text verse tonight, verse 14, but this I confess. He said, y'all accuse me of all kind of stuff, but I will admit to one thing, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believe in all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious, conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Paul said, look, y'all, y'all accusing me of everything in the book, but I am guilty of what you're about me worshiping the right God and believe in the right book, guilty as charged. I want to use that little thought tonight, and I want to preach on this subject. Christians with attitudes. Christians with attitude. About, I don't know, probably been 20 years ago now, I begin to hear that little word pop up a lot. I remember when people didn't used to say that. And then all of a sudden, somebody's kid would act up in public, and they'd say, well, why don't you do something with that brat? And they said, oh, they get an, he just got an attitude. And I thought, well, um, that's, that's a weird way to put it, but I understand what you're saying. And then sometimes uh, a teenage girl would mouth off to her mother a little bit, back talk her mom a little bit, and she said, don't you get no attitude with me, girl. And, and then I, I began to pick up on it, uh, what it means, and people still say that to this day. So I, in that sense, I'm going to use this as a sermon title tonight. Usually when somebody's talking about an attitude, we mean something in a bad, uh, cocky, or smart aleck kind of a uh, brat, bratty kind of a way. And, um, so, uh, and there is such a thing as, as the right things to have an attitude about. The, the, the definition of attitude is a way of thinking, a way of thinking, acting, or feeling, or manner of behavior of a person toward a situation or a cause. One more time. An attitude is a way of thinking, acting, feeling, manner of behavior of a person toward something or a cause. In other words, uh, there's some things that really get to you, you can get an attitude about them. Now, there's some things we couldn't care less about. But there's some things God's people should have the right kind of attitude about. Uh, when I, I heard somebody say uh, they went to school back in the old days when we went, and when you got in trouble at school, they'd warn you, and then maybe they'd make you uh, sit in the lunchroom or miss playground, miss play period or something like that, and then finally you'd get sent to the principal, and they'd say the principal would reach under the, under the drawer in the drawer and pull out a piece of wood about that big, and it was called attitude adjuster. And, you know, just like you adjust the temperature on the, on the air condition. And uh, I know some, y'all kids sitting here tonight think, oh, how awful. That's exactly what's wrong with y'all right now. Uh, uh, that's why you the brat you are today. Uh, your attitude wasn't adjusted enough. <laughs> and, and, they, and the guys take, they take one, I mean, telling you, as big as this neck of this guitar right here. And that whole thing, wham! And, boy, they would adjust, you'd straighten right up. I mean, it'd fix you just like that. And uh, they call that an attitude adjuster. And I'm not, I'm not saying beat kids or nothing like that. But uh, uh, we, we, there's some things tonight we as Christians ought to have an attitude about. And you'll get it when I say it. And there's just three or four, and I'll name it right quick. And I will say, first of all, this. We, are, we have an attitude about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an attitude. That's non-negotiable. 
I mean, that's it, brother. Uh, we, we have an attitude about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ done more for me and you than anybody who's ever lived or will live or has lived. You ought to have an attitude. It ought to bother you when people degrade, downgrade, and especially use as a curse word the name of Jesus Christ. That ought to bother you. Now, I, when you're out with a bunch of people, and um, uh, my mom's name Betty. My mom's last name was Beam. Her, her uh, maiden name was Beam. And if I was out uh, playing basketball with some boys or something like that, and, and one of them got mad and threw the ball down or something, and he said, I blankety blank, Betty Beam, you know, and, and use, or, or call me a bad word about my mother, I'd, I'd get mad. I'd get, I'd get an attitude. And you're not much of a, uh, of, a, of a person if you wouldn't. If you'd let somebody curse your mother, uh, there's something wrong with you. You know, anybody, normal person, is not going to just stand there and let somebody talk bad about their mama. They're not going to do it. And uh, I, I'm not. And you know, I'll say something. I don't care how big they are. I'm going to say something. That's my mom. And you ain't going to say, shut up. You're not going to talk that way about her. Now, I'm going to tell you something this evening. The Lord Jesus Christ done more for me than my mama. He, he died for me on the cross. My mama never even did that. He, he suffered the pains of death for my soul and to keep me from burning in hell. You, you understand that? He kept us from burning in hell, people, and screaming in fire, begging God for mercy, went to the cross and paid the price for our sin. But we ought to have an attitude about that. It ought to bother us when, when people at work say, I've, I've heard somebody the other day, they come in and say, well, Jesus, I don't know what to do about this. Well, Jesus, that ought to bother you. I ought to get an attitude about that. That ought, to make, that ought to make cold chills run up your spine. That ought to make, I mean, that ought to bother you. That ought to make something rise up in you. I, I'm not telling you to get in fights or nothing, but uh, it wouldn't be wrong if you had to. Uh, it's not like cussing your Savior. I will tell you this. There's something wrong with you if you can sit and watch a movie where people just say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, in a, in a way of profanity. There's something wrong with you. He he died for you, friend. He died to keep you out of hell. I don't care how good the movie is. I don't care what a plot it has. I don't care how pretty the ladies are. I don't care how good looking the main player is. They're not going to sit in my house and curse my Savior and use Jesus' name as a curse word. Ain't going to happen by the grace of God. You say, Brother Danny, would you let somebody talk like that in your house? No, I wouldn't. I've had people leave before. I had a guy sitting in my house one time. He's over there talking about me trying to help him get his wife back. And he's cussing and cussing. My girl, two of them was little. Chris and Corey's running through the house. And they're little. I said, now look, you're not going to talk like that in my house. And finally, he kept cussing and blankety blank this and blank about that. And I said, look, I'm not trying to be mean or, or mean to you or nothing, but you're not going to talk like that. This is my house. I'm responsible for this house. I'll answer to God for what goes on in this house. You cannot talk like that. He finally left. And I, you know how how bad I felt about that? No bad. None bad at all. I'm not going to let somebody come in my house, TV, radio, talk show, anything, and degrade and defame and take in profanity the name that is above every name. That Bible said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And brother, we got an attitude about the Lord Jesus Christ. We sure do. Uh, uh, the NEA, that's the National Endowment of the Arts, that the government uses our tax dollars to support, had a art, they called it, and it was a, a, a figure of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, submerged in human urine. They called that art, I call it filthy blasphemy. And that fight, there are people here in this country tonight, there's people right here in Morgan would get mad at me. They said, well, they have the artistic expression and everything. I say, okay, put one of Muhammad in human urine and watch what happens. You'd start World War III. I'm telling you, they might have a right to do it, but I got a right to scream and holler, it's wrong too. I'm telling you, he's my savior. He's my best friend. He's the one that's took me through all the troubles that I've been through and will take me on the rest of the way. He died for me. Hallelujah, I got an attitude about that. You ought to too. Not a smart aleck, but an attitude. Number two, number two, we have an attitude about the Bible. We have an attitude about the Bible. 
Uh, it's not optional. It's not like, well, the Bible's our religious book and the Koran's your religious book and the Bahama Gita's your religious book and the, and the writings of the Shastas and the, all them people are your religious group. No, 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 no. We got an attitude about the Bible. I like what old brother Ed Maccabee said when he stood up here years ago. He said, they called me narrow-minded because I believe. He said, I'll show you how narrow-minded I am right there. That's how narrow I am. Genesis, Revelation. Genesis, Revelation. That's how narrow-minded we are. Say what you want to. Criticize, laugh, mock, make fun, write books, lie about us, whatever you want. Brother, we've got an attitude about this book. There's no other book in the world like that book. There's no other book that can predict the future and get it right every time. There's no other book that has the inspiration breath of God on it like that book right there. There's never been a book in its class. It was here before all the other books got here. It'll be when all the rest of them's gone. Forever settled in heaven. It's God's word and we got an attitude about the Bible. Amen? We got an attitude about the Bible. Years ago, there was a show on TV. Most of y'all don't remember. It's called Doctari. And it's some old jungle show about exploration in the jungle in South America and Africa or somewhere. I don't remember hardly. But uh, they said that Doc Tari said this. He was laughing at the Bible. And he said, if you give em- enough chimpanzees, he said, if you give enough chimpanzees, enough typewriters, one of them will come up with a version of the Bible. That's what he said. Ted Turner, who uh, was the owner of uh, on CNN, I think I own the uh, Turner Broadcasting Network, used to, and uh, some of the major movies, theater, movie uh, channels in the world, multi-millionaire, billionaire, whatever. Ted Turner said, quote, quote, he said, I don't want anybody dying for my sin. He said, I've had a few drinks and a few girlfriends. If that puts me in hell, so be it. You know what we say to that? Out of thine own mouth, God will judge you, thou wicked servant. By thy words, thou shalt be justified, and by thy words, thou shalt be condemned. He'll regret them words one of these days. One of these days, he'll fall on his knees and cry out to God and bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and admit that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, you know what the Bible is? The Bible is a, is, a, is a book of history. It's a book of science. Every, it, it's, not, it's not just a science book, but where it speaks, it's scientifically correct. It's not just a history book, but where it speaks, it's historically correct. And if they disagree with that, they're wrong, and it's still right. And you'll find out the judgment one of these days. But that book right there, that book teaches us about history. And a great old man said one time, he said, the, they that condemn uh, refuse to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. And everybody in here has heard the old saying, history repeats itself. That's true. And mankind keeps going making the same mistakes over and reason God put all them stories about the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and the Tower of Babel was to teach us them people did that and look what happened to them. Them people did that and look what happened to them. Let's don't. But it seems like mankind is hell bent on making the same mistakes over and over and over and the Bible condemns it. Now look, I heard uh, uh, old Dr. Ruckman say uh, many times and he gives you a, a cycle of history and he'd read more books than anybody I've ever, ever heard of and was smarter than anybody I've ever heard talk. Don't mean he knows everything. Don't mean he's right on everything. But it does mean he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, IQ of like 200, something like that. And he put it like this. Here's what he said. He said, a nation goes when they get their liberty. A nation goes in, in uh, transition periods. And a nation goes from liberty to abundance. From abundance to compromise. From compromise to indifference. To indifference to deception. From deception to dependency. And from dependency back into bondage. And he said that's the cycle 
of human history. You can read it in Japan. You can read Germany. You can read England. You can read uh, the history of the world, empires, Greece, Rome, uh, Babylonian, all those empires. And he said mankind goes in a cycle. When people really pray and God gives them something, it's liberty, abundance, compromise, indifference, deception, dependency, back to bondage. You know where we are in this country on that scale? Next to the last one. We went from liberty to abundance. God blessed our country like no other country had been blessed outside of Israel itself. We went from abundance to compromise. We went from compromise to indifference. Who cares? We went from indifference to deception the last 50 years. We went from that to almost dependency. We're all dependent on the government to take care of us, and then it's back to bondage. You know where you get that? The Bible. We get an attitude about the Bible. The Bible's the best book on raising children in print today. You want to know how to raise kids? Get in your Bible. The Bible's the best marriage counseling book in print today. You want to know how to have a good marriage? I have mar do marriage counseling all the time. Some of them listen to me online right now and, and all over the country in different parts of the world. I can tell you what the Bible says. If, the, if any two people who are married, I don't care who they are, any two people that are married, if both of them will do what that book said, they can stay married. They can make it. Now, if one of them won't, ain't nothing you can do about it. If both of them won't, there ain't much you can do about it. But if a husband will love his wife like Christ loved the church and the wife will reverence and respect her husband, you can make it. It may not be he heaven on earth, but I'm telling you, you can make it by the grace of God. That's the best marriage counseling there is on planet earth. Hear me tonight. We got an attitude about the Bible. Number three, we have an attitude about church. I talked about it this morning, so I'll not take a, a lot of time on it this morning, this evening. Uh, we have an attitude about church. That's right. Uh, church shouldn't be just a part of our lives. Shouldn't be just a part of our lives. It should be the main part of our lives outside of our own home itself. Church and God and the Bible. I remember a few years ago, I heard old, uh, old, old, I read where old Tony Evans said this, and he said, uh, he said years ago, and I remember this, when, when they come out with them TVs that had PIP in it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Picture in picture. I, I don't even know if they still do that anymore. They probably do. But anyway, what it is, you got a big screen TV, a PIP, picture in picture, is a little picture down here. So you can be watching uh, uh, the, the weather and then the picture in picture is a football game or the other way around. Uh, you'd be watching a football game and watch the weather down here. And he said the picture in the picture is not the big picture. It's just a little side picture. It's just something you, you just keep looking at every once in a while to keep up with the score or if it's going to rain or whatever. This is the main picture. The big picture is this, that. And he said, did you know that's the way most people are about church? Most people have their, their job, their friends, their lifestyle, their social clubs, all that. And church is a little picture in picture. Just glance at it once a week on Sunday morning, but then watch the big show. Now, that ain't the way it ought to be. It ought to be the big show. Our Christian life ought to be the big picture. Everything else is the little picture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we got a picture. Everybody who knows me, everybody who knows me, I plead guilty after the way which they call heresy. I am an absolute church fanatic. I believe you go, brother, no matter how bad the weather is. <laughs> Y'all know me, I'm crazy. I, I understand if you don't agree with me, you're probably more right. Uh, but I'm crazy. I believe, bless God, you, they'll have to roll me in here one of these days. But I want to be in the house of God. If I'm able, I want to be in church. When my kids was little, Lord, we went to church, come snow, come hot water, uh, uh, no water. I mean, come drought, uh, come flood. If the power went off, I mean, I, I'm, when I was little, I I'd say, say, Daddy, I'm sick. I, I can't go. Prove it. Throw up. <laughs> I can't throw up. You ain't sick enough to stay home. That's right. That's right. You ain't throw, sick enough to throw up. You don't ain't sick enough to stay out of church. A headache, you might as well come here and sit with a headache and stay at home with one. Say amen right there. Amen. amen. I got an attitude about church. My philosophy is if you let one thing stop you, you'll let other stuff stop you. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying if you can't, you can't. If you can't, you can't. If you can't, you can't. Did you hear me? 
If you can't, you can't. But if you can, you should. You say, well, what if I throw it up? I'd say, well, you feel better now, don't you? Let's go to church. Don't you always feel better after you throw up? Yeah, you feel real good for about 15 minutes. <laughs> it comes back on you. Lord, we went down we went down Hoppy Tom Holler with them crying jelly on their dress and everything else, slinging diapers out the window and everything else. I know, I know you ain't supposed to do that, but you try it sometime. The pastor of the church would have to be there early and greet everybody that's mad and go and get fussed at for stuff. <laughs> and they'll try it sometime. I've got an attitude about church. I think a man ought to be in church. I think you ought to have your family in church. If you possibly can, be there when them doors are open. Amen, Amen brother. Amen. You say, I don't get nothing out of it. Don't, don't matter. Come anyway. Give some. Stand up and hug somebody or tell them you love them or give them $10. If you can't get nothing out of it, give something to it. Our old uh, preacher said the other day, he said, he said, I love my wife. old country preacher. He said, I love my wife so much. He said, there ain't nothing that I wouldn't do for her. And he said, she loves me so much. There ain't nothing that she wouldn't do for me. So all we do is sit around all day and do nothing for each other. <laughs> he, he said, we, we sit on the front porch and don't do nothing. I thought, That's, that sounds like some church man. All they do is sit around and do nothing. Do nothing. You're nothing but a nothing. To be a bat is one thing, an ugly and a mean thing, but you're not anything. You're not a thing at all. You're nothing. You're nothing. I've heard that for two weeks ever since I preached on it. Everybody's been going around saying it. We have an attitude about the church. Amen? That's right. It's amazing. And it's the same people that make their kids go to school. Won't let them miss one day of school. And it'll take them off gallivanting all over creation every Sunday Picnic one Sunday, lake next Sunday, pretty weather next Sunday, then too bad weather next Sunday, and see Mama all the next Sunday, and see Mama all the next. I'm telling you, we ought to have an attitude about the church. Yes, sir, brother. I know some people, you know, some people are nervous at church. Uh, as old preacher said, they're as nervous as a termite and a yo-yo. He said that one guy, he said that guy, uh, he, he was so nervous, so he was nervous he went to church, he could thread a needle on a sewing machine with it running. Uh, I mean, that's how much he's shaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, no, I don't feel nervous when I'm at church. This is my father's house. George Bernard Shaw said this. He said this, quote, and here's what the elite, wicked, ungodly crowd wants to do to this world. There's a growing perception that if we desire a certain type of civilization or culture, we must exterminate the kind of people who do not fit into it. Guess who that is? Us. Guess who are the people who do not fit into the new culture and generation and civilization? Us. We got to go. And we're going. The church. Number four, and I'm through. We have an attitude about salvation by grace. I said the world push-up champion one time. Who is the world push-up champion? I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt it. Look at them little noodles. <laughs> he can barely match them piano keys down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He is not the, the world champion push-up. He might be Miami Pool. Jeff Worley is. Him or Eric won. I won this year. But anyway, my brother Mike might be. I don't know. But anyway, somebody was witnessing to the world push-up champion. And they was trying to talk to him about the Lord. And you know what he said? He said, uh, I, don't, I don't get into all that stuff. That's sort of a waste of time. The dude did pu he done push-ups four hours a day. Four hours a day. I'm telling you. I mean, I can, do, I can do a few push-ups, you know, especially like this. They're easy. Can you imagine doing that four hours a day? What in the world? Now, I got little thing like little hand things that I squeeze, and I got a little 12-pound little dumb. I took them to Florida with us. I done all down there, back, down there, back, because I don't want my arm turning to flab. And, and I need my wrist. I need it. I need my wrist bad to function as an athlete. 
<laughs> I do. I need my wrist bad. And and I, you can ask her. I done this. I done two. I don't do them all at the same time, but I lift them weight. Twelve pound, twelve pound, twelve pound, twelve pound, twelve pound, twelve pound. You do thirty four. I do one thirty four and then two thirty threes. That, that's hundred. And I do that. But I'm telling you, I'm not gonna do push ups four hours a day. I'm not gonna do it. But I tell you what, I could do four hours a day. I could get in this book, and have a Bible study, go witness, help somebody about the Lord, go to church. We got an attitude about salvation and stuff. It's priorities. It's what's most important to you. What does the Bible say? Bodily exercise profiteth little, little. Bodily exercise ain't the main thing, people. I mean, you should, you should. I mean, God give you a body. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. We should try to take care of it, and I'm trying, I'm trying. And I, I do a bunch of them, and then I eat ice cream. And then I do a bunch of them, and then I eat ice cream. And I, I, and I, and I thought, well, it cancels it out, you know. Uh, that, that, that makes up for me, you know. And I, I run two miles in sweat, so that. And I went and bought moose tracks and, uh, and Pepsi's and put them in my refrigerator. And we ate ice cream every night last week. But I exercised it out. And you know what that is? That's about an absolute waste of time. About a waste of time. Ladies and gentlemen, you can tie a knot in time that you can't undo in eternity. You kids listen to me tonight. The most important thing is not how smart you are, how tall you get, how far you can run, how high you can jump. That is all well and good. The most important thing is that you know, that you know, that you know that he's come into your heart and he lives inside you and you have eternal life. Have an attitude about that. A sparrow falling don't go without him noticing it. And so he is definitely, definitely concerned about our salvation. I have an attitude about salvation by grace. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's some things we ought to have an attitude. Don't be smart, Alec, but just have an attitude about. No, non-negotiable. There's some things we can bend on. There's some things we can give a little here and there. There's, it's not even wrong to compromise about things that are not, not essential and, and, and it's not, even, not wrong to do that. But there's some things that are absolutely non-negotiable. We stand here. And that's it. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Miss Desi will come, please, and play something softly. I'd like to ask you a question tonight. We're just in this little Sunday evening meeting we've had here tonight, this little short message on Christians with attitudes. I'd like to ask you a question. What's first place in your life? You know what I'm praying will happen at camp or before camp? That all these young people in here would really get a touch and sell out. Let the Lord be first place in everything. And they need to see some people do it first. They need to see some older people who'll do it. And I'm praying that I'm praying that our counselors will get a fresh touch from God. I'm praying that our teenagers will get just a fresh touch and sell out to the Lord. The Lord ain't going to hurt you, kids. He's not going to hurt you. You say, well, if I got right with the Lord, I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. Listen, he ain't going to hurt you. He'll give you something way better. I'm telling you, he'll give you something way better. I mean, you ain't going to hell. It ain't going to kill you to give up some things that ain't right. wonder if there'd be others. Some's come already. Would there others come here tonight? Just get down on your knees and say, Lord, I want to keep the main thing, the main thing. Amen. Others, others are coming. Thank God. Others are coming. Just slide right out of your seat. Just slide right out of your seat and say, Lord, I want to keep the main thing, the main thing. I want to keep what's right first place in my life. Lord, help me to have the right attitude. We get attitude about stuff that don't even matter. Let's get attitude about stuff that does matter. The right attitude. Amen. The right way of thinking or behavior toward about a certain thing. Amen. Amen. Others, others tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never been saved. You don't know if you're going to heaven or hell. You're, you're
say, well, preacher, I'm not even saved. You can come get saved tonight. You can come get saved. Come on. Come on. Somebody will help you. Somebody will take the Bible and show you exactly what you've got to do to get saved. Bow right down here at this altar. Somebody will help you. Somebody will help you. You come right now. Come on. Come on right now. Amen. You come on right now. Let the Lord help you. Heavenly Father, I do pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you'd come upon us and use us for thy glory. Help us to do right. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you'd move in mighty, mighty Holy Ghost power on these folks here tonight, on our church, on me. God, get us ready for camp. God, get us ready for a big week. I pray for all of our brothers and sisters that are traveling, maybe on vacation, that you'd watch over them, take care of them. Those that are sick, not able to be out here tonight, I pray you'd help them. Uh, Lord, I pray, uh, Brother Wayne, Brother Roy, others, Lord, that are having uh, physical difficulty, I pray that you'd help them. Have, you, have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. Do what ought to be done in our life. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Just a second, just a second, okay? Go ahead, Andy. I want to give you a couple thoughts right quick. I want to talk about camp just a second. <clears throat> and then 